Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, Mr. Happy Mondays, a weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. I'm not going to lie, I really just want to get through this so I can go back to finishing the World of Light and Smash, even though I'm probably not going to be streaming after I'm done recording this Q&A, but uh, I'm, I've, it feels good. <laughs> Smash feels good. It feels like I have a $60 game before I even play anyone else in the actual online in terms of the World of Light, and I haven't even touched Classic Mode, so it's been a hell of a purchase, and I'm having a hell of a time with it, but... Before we can go on into the Q&A, we, of course, have our sponsors over on Patreon who have been supporting through hashtag demonetized. We have, of course, our patrons of light, Kuja Cross on Genova and Kurenai Oni, who have been massive supporters over the last several months, almost a year for one of you. And uh, yeah, you guys have been awesome. So there's been Im there's images on the screen for both of them on the YouTube side of things. And on the Twitch side of things, you guys won't see anything. You'll see my face. And I'm sorry. I know it's hideous, but, you know, meh. Meh, meh. Uh, we also have our long list of sponsors. We have our standard sponsors, starting with Wabatalia, Alma Elma, Dark Lumina from Genova, Marianne, Ramil Gaming, Sabo Empire, Mizra, Red Wings of the Baron FC from Zalera, Frey Blackheart, Sidus Oreo and Shiva, Sid Helwin of Gilgamesh, Afronasia from Malboro, Cheesecake from Leviathan, That Lame Weave, Ashenamia of Cerberus, Fafarian, Rendell, Stevie Rex, and Neon. We have our elite sponsors. We have Craze Demeter from Midgard. We have Rajin Ventinus from Cactar, Carol, Ray, Senchi, Shadowlink from Tonberry, Dom, Sukawig from Genova, Lamillionella of Makerd's Armor, Sarah and the Fennel Family, Johnny Yatsu, Kefkin the Great Eagles on Exodus, Dark Craver, Kadayoshi from Kujata, Skis of Funny from Ragnarok, Rallinger, West Austin Purple Warrior, Edge of Great Steel on Exodus, Lexi Valentine, Mantaran the Rivus FC from Zodiac, Sour Cream and Tribes from Genova, Renoa, Chikara, Goish Valfar of Siren, Phoenix Down FC on Goblin, and Saren from Zodiac. And finally, we have our premium sponsors, Nyrak Vizzle of the Red. Alchemy, Shinka, Casual Heroes FC on Midgard's Armor, Tatachi Taka on Hyperion, Kanazuki from Genova, U Starl on Coral, Sathal, Sarah Frost from Behemoth, Holy Tabasco, Red Thorn and Sarah, Cry 015, Mustang, Straight FC on Ultras, Kat Kazuma, Ignis Faragon from Excalibur, Vlesha of Fanfret, Knock Corps from Excalibur, Corvus Moonscar, Private Mikey, Nani Kirasami, Rudy Rudiger, Killer Hackman, Old Junior, and Kiltastic Jones. Woo! Got through that one without much of a slip up at all. That's a rare occurrence for me, but thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors. And for that, and with that, I should say, screwed up after it was all said and done, let's get into the questions. We'll see how many we have on the forums, and then we'll see if we have time for Twitch questions after that. Let's get started. All right, question number one. Hello, Mr. Happy. I hope this finds you in good spirits and early Merry Xmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. An early one, of course. And Happy Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and all the holidays. I'm sure I'll forget. I'll, I'll, I will forget one English, please, for me. So as I read the forum, see a lot of people talking about in-game rating and which job survival. That is my question. Does it matter? I mean, really matter. Is that something the dev team should actually spend time on? Give every job utility so it could bring something to the raid team. To me, if the job is fun to play, it doesn't ultimately matter how viable it is in raiding, especially since we know any instance can be cleared with any job. At the same time, you see people talk about this a lot. It's clearly important to them. Does it partially feel wrong to just be to ignore that desire? So you always want to balance things and make them more desirable to play compared to their counterparts. That being said, it, the real question is, does it really matter? And it doesn't matter from a clear content standpoint it clears from a play it matters from a player perspective standpoint like if machinist feels terrible to play or if a job is clearly worse than every other job in the raid scene it's our job as the players to let the developers know that it's perceived as weaker and then the developers need to take that information weigh it across what they have and see what changes can be made or what should be done or what shouldn't be done so it's up to we should be expressing that if there's a dislike about something with a job but in terms of actually clearing anything it doesn't it doesn't matter like i don't like white mage lilies but it's never stopped me from using white mage for anything uh you know i don't like machinist okay yeah it stopped me pretty pretty much from playing machinist at all but regardless of that it's not like it performs poorly it's just not fun for me to play which is something i should also convey so no and yes depends on exactly what part of the question we're referring to but i think i've made my point Question number two. Hey, Mr. Happy, not long now till your cake day. Yeah, I'm going to New Jersey on Wednesday, so I'll celebrate my cake day and my mother's cake day when I go and visit the fam for the holidays. Uh, may it feel like all your name days have come at once. Well, hopefully only the ones past and not the ones coming, because otherwise i got a short life ahead of me. Anywho, on to the questions. After watching the Noclip documentary, that's an old one, haven't heard that in a while. What do you think is the most important thing Square Enix needs to take on board in their future titles? Graphics don't win everything. That was one of the key things that ruined 1.x, and Noclip makes that incredibly apparent. 
And that is the number one thing. Graphics don't mean everything. Gameplay matters over. But losses taken after the Luminous Studio Engine debacle. So there's no losses. That, that's been a really common misconception regarding the financial reports. Luminous has a $33 million debt to the company in a sense that they, it's what it sounds like, at least. They were given a budget to work on a new AAA title and Tabata left. So that's what it, it actually reads. I would like to remind everyone that Final Fantasy XV profited the day it launched with its sales. It broke even and then profited as like from day one onward. So Luminous hasn't necessarily lost money, but they now owe a debt to the rest of the company after being budgeted this $33 million. That seems to be what the actual taking place is. It's very clear, it's been made very clear that 15 has been a profitable venture across Square Enix. So uh, I don't think that has anything to do with anything. 15's proven itself in terms of revenue income. Especially if you if you want to credit a new empire, even though it has nothing to do with the actual 15 team, that game makes apparently a million dollars a day. So yes, that's $365 million in a year. Nothing to do with 15, but that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I could not believe that figure when it was made public. So as a content streamer and producer, what would you love to uh, see come to video games that could give new ways to create, play, and share content? I don't know. It depends on the person. I always like things that aren't incredibly obvious as you're playing through a game. I always like some cryptic bullshit, but only to some degree. And it's because I like to make guides so people who can't find the cryptic bullshit on their own have to look it up, and then I make content on it. That's, that's for me, the premier content as a content creator. Something that isn't abundantly obvious in the game that you're playing or could use further elaboration. Things that have small little uh, techniques or ways that you can abuse or exploit them or things that really play to my strengths. And I think Final Fantasy XV was wonderful for that. My YouTube channel flourished from Final Fantasy XV content. Uh, whether it was the Ultima Weapon video or Dungeon Clip, it did fantastic on the channel because there was tons of stuff to go out and explore. I don't necessarily want that kind of Final Fantasy game again for the same reason. I would like them to either uh, return to form in other ways, or maybe move into something that's not necessarily more linear, but has a bit more, uh, progressive storytelling, I suppose, instead of this open world where you choose to go to the story when you want. Uh, but yeah, it depends. You gotta find a happy medium, and I think they could do a better job on that in future titles. All right. Question number three is a short one. Hello, Mr. Happy. I wish you a beautiful Monday. I wish you a beautiful one in return. My question is, what do you think of the Omega Mount? That's a very basic question. Uh, I like, I always love when they add details, smaller details to mounts. Things like the Namazu hanging off the back of the Mikoshi or the sink or you like being pulled into the center of Omega when it flies. I always love little things like that. The Omega Mount in particular, uh, the, all the little twitching and the and the the motors that um, motors the 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 boosters that are on the bottom, all those little moving components, I always have a great degree of appreciation for. So it's one of it's definitely one of my higher rated mounts, especially from the ones that come from the actual raid scene. Question number four, hola, Captain Happy. Haven't asked a question in a while, so have a <laughs> XD. <laughs> I'm sorry. You should be. A couple of questions. First one, Omega Fight has your favorite music. Uh, oh, 11 takes the cake. I, I have one of my biggest disappointments in all of Omega was that from one through eight, yes, we got remixes of beloved themes and the Neo X Death one in particular, I'm a big fan of, but I always love to see so constructed stuff on something original. And 011 for me takes the cake. I think it's honestly the only one. Yeah, 012 has got some good music, but it's kind of more in the generic Final Fantasy route, whereas 11 really feels like Omega's theme. Second, and I'm thinking of gifting a friend's 30 day playtime. What options are there to do this? Well, you can just straight up give him like a like a prepaid card to buy Krista. Uh, you could buy game time cards off Amazon, and that's probably going to be the route that you take. And that's those are those your options. So go with those, or just put it on your credit card and pay for him forever. Don't recommend doing that. Thanks and happy Monday or Sunday. Have a happy day. You have a happy one as well. Question. Number five. Hi, Mr. Happy Man. I asked before and someone reported my question. Does, uh, I, I have some Mog Station codes for emotes. Can I give them to you as a Christmas gift? Uh, to give them away to others. Well, kind of a weird place to ask that. Uh, I mean, you'd probably be best just showing up to my stream and giving them away at some point while I'm live. It's so been like, hey, here you go. Like, cause, uh, Mog Station codes are, well, Mog Station codes actually are one of the easiest things to give away on, uh, Final Fantasy 14 because they're not region specific. So uh, as opposed to things like game time codes or copies of games, which can very often be tied to either DRM service or specific region, which can also be linked to a DRM service, which causes issues. So I know it's probably best best to show up when I'm streaming at some point. 
Uh, okay, number two, what do you think the Grand Company minigame will be? Oh, Gold Saucer, you mean. Oh, it's totally going to be Blitzball. I've given up the, ho the hope that Blitzball won't happen in this game. Like, we've all known it's going to happen for some time. The minigame that they wouldn't detail, I wanted to believe so bad that it was just the game they immediately talked about. But as soon as they said, and I went back and remembered, and they said, Oh, this there's brand new content that we will talk about in the Letter from the Producer Live Part 2. And then we have this Rail Shooter Gate. Then I was like, it's, it's fucking Blitzball. Like, it's not gonna... I doubt it's the Battle Arena. It's not gonna be snowboarding. It's gonna be fucking Blitzball. They've been talking about it all expansion. What else do they need to get people to play from 4.5 to 5.0? I have no hope for it in terms of being, like, widely successful. But I have no doubt that that's what it's gonna be. And I'm sad. Question number six. A. Haps incoming wall of text. Before you read this question aloud, I want you to read it to yourself to see if it's appropriate to ask here. Doesn't seem like it isn't. I'm looking at... I mean, it seems like a really basic question. It's, you're not asking me about, like, my dick, so it's pretty appropriate. I have been accruing a backlog of games for three years. I want to stream more often, but it's hard to find time to do it. My backlog is, like, 30-plus games. I want to build a community where we hang out, play games. Motivation for streaming is that I want to share my experience of me if, although playing a game for the first time with others, it's hard to find the time to do so. I you know, just play the game and enjoy myself. It is a very opinionated question. You literally either press the live button or you don't. That's it. That's, that's, you do one of those two things. If you have the time to play the game, you have the time to stream the game. That's my consideration. Unless you have like a child that needs attention, in which case you can't be doing that on stream. So it's a simple answer. Do you want to press live or do you not want to press live? If the answer is no, then just play them on your own. If you do, then start streaming them. That's it. It's gaming is as much a hobby as streaming can be, and they can overlap. So that's it. That's, that's all you gotta do. Question number seven. Hey, Mr. Happy Man. What am I happy man? Like, why does why does that become a thing? I didn't make that a thing. Listening to your PvP state of the realm, what is what is your what do you think is preventing us or Square Enix from giving a PvP mode like capture flag? I don't fucking know! It infuriates me! Why? Why don't we just have the most basic of PvP things? Is it because they're so basic we're supposed to be above them or something? No! Fuck it! Capture the flag! <laughs> it's such a simple mode. I don't know why we have all these just arcing rule sets and we have to redefine every fucking map that comes out. Just do it! Just do the flag mode with the thing! Please! Please! Question number eight on that note. Hello, Mr. Happy. Merry Christmas to you and yours. Merry Christmas to you as well. Still got some time till until Christmas, but early Christmas. Sorry if it seems out of left field, but do you have a Steel Series sponsorship? Yeah, I, I do still have a Steel Series sponsorship, and if so, is there a code I could use to buy some? Do I get to sell out in the middle of a YouTube video? Hell yeah! So you know what? We are sponsored by Steel Series. At the in the description of every YouTube video, it says that. It also comes with a discount code that saves you 10%. Now, to be fair, you don't need that discount code to give me credit or anything. It's there because I wanted a discount for you guys. That's the only reason. If they have a better discount on the website, you can find a better discount on Amazon. Do that, buy that, don't care. Because SteelSeries sponsors me, which means they, they'll take care of me. As long as I'm telling you and you're buying, so that's it, we're good. Still series has got my back, so I'm just take care of yourself when it comes to the, you know, cost of everything from that. Also, what keyboard or mouse would you recommend for a somewhat casual player? I don't need some top of the line keyboard, but if it lasts longer, it's clearly a better one. I don't mind spending more. I have the Apex M750. Uh, personally, I, for me, I don't really think you need an M750. You could probably do with a 350. Uh, the M750, though, it's not too high on the price point, but if you were more casual player, I don't think you need the higher-end hardware. I mean, you said it yourself. Same with the mouse. Like, if you don't need a bunch of MMO buttons, then you would get a 600 or something like that. Whereas I use an MMO mouse, which is the 500, which is actually comparable price-wise, so it's literally a preference thing. So, uh, yeah, one of those, one of those two. Three, either 350 or the 750 for the keyboard, and for the mouse, MMO mouse 500, not MMO mouse 600. And you can even go a model below the 600, because there is a cheaper one there. Thank you for all you do, and hope to see you for years to come. Thank you, and thanks to SteelSeries for sponsoring our content. All right, question number nine. Hello, Mr. Happy. I've been a long-time watcher of YouTube content ever th since you got on Sephiroth EX. Thank you. Just want to say thank you for all the hard work. No, thank you for watching. You guys have been very helpful and been fantastic for myself as a monk trying to survive pugs doing 012 Savage. Whew. Have fun with that. Well, let's do some other high-end content. It's my first time asking a question, so apologies if things look off. But I guess it's the first time bonus of a voucher of a free two-course meal at a restaurant of your choosing. It's all right. I'll cover the third cost. No, no, that's cool. It's cool. Actually, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to do that less 
because I uh, I overeat at home, but I don't overeat when I'm out. So I'm trying to like, I haven't been to the grocery store in like two and a half weeks. I've just been kind of eating the bare minimum around my house just to, just to try and reduce that amount so I can take care of this life for as long as it'll be around. I have a choice of two questions you can pick from, whichever you prefer. One is more of a suggestion for additional content for gear progression, which I've been looking at for the live letter in place, but I haven't had a chance. It'd be great to hear your opinion on it. It's okay if you'd rather answer the other question. I'd definitely rather answer the other question because opinionated pieces are always a bit rough on this. So, now the first fan fest has passed, we got a hint one of the new jobs. Remembering back when we were waiting for Stormblood, we saw Red Mage and Samurai, both were DPS dev developers playing. They didn't want to add a tank and a healer, mainly because they want to try fixing the bouncing. With 4.5 on the way, possibly more job adjustments, what are your thoughts on how tanks and healers are now, bounce-wise or even design and system-wise? The OGP and the others have them in a good spot. I know most people will probably disagree with me. I do actually think they have them in a fairly good spot. Dark Knight's biggest problem is that it's not fun to play. Functionally, though, it's proven itself well and beyond being able to be to stand on par with the other two one thing it's missing raid wide damage reduction but it has its other uses and it's also not really that mandatory to use that a lot of the times when i was progressing veil was kind of used just wherever because why not it wasn't really that strategically used so uh we would have been fine with having a tbn just a matter of you know not like that could they maybe use a little performance buff? Eh, probably but i think they've nailed that for healers I used White Mage Scholar for Prague, and then this White Mage switched to Astro because it was just better. And that's a thing. O12 uh, in particular, Astro kind of just is designed better. In fact, in a lot of places, it is more on the fight design than on White Mage. For White Mage, the bigger problem is not performance, it's identity, because the Lilies are stupid. They serve no purpose. They're, they're, they're just weird. Doesn't make any sense. I want them to fix the identity of White Mage with whatever they're doing job balance-wise in 5.0. And they've already mentioned that they're looking at reworking Dark Knight to be uh, based on direct feedback that's been given to them on the forums. Other than that, I think they actually have them all fairly close together. Uh, so, yeah, I think they've actually done a good job. And I'm fairly confident we'll get a tank and a healer in this expansion. Uh, oh, boy, that's... That's a lot of text. I feel like I probably answered the question because this seems to be more like how, what kind of healer, what kind of tank could they add? I'll just say this. There's a lot of ideas they have not dived into. They've tried to keep two ideas and make it so both tanks or both healers can be either of them, whether it be like shielding or raid utility or personal, whatever. They all have like an identity and they try to split it between the third job. I don't think they need to worry about that with this fourth one. Just do, so do something different do something where you put dots on the target and it sprinkles heals periodically across the people who are nearby do something with a tank where they i don't know where they build ammunition if it's a gun blade or some shit and the ammo does all sorts of different things just get the just get the theme down and functionally i'm sure they'll fall into place question number 10 hey happy long time viewer first time poster have a pizza on me dude i'm in california when i go back to new jersey i'm getting a fucking pizza like a good one like a real fucking pizza. I'm on Wednesday. I'm getting a goddamn pizza. All right. I've played the MSQ up to Balesar's Wall. And I've got Stormblood, but I had to quit a while for real life reasons. I hasn't done anything. I'm a little nervous about coming back. I get these kind of questions all the time. Never used the new job resource bars. Yeah, you just get used to them. To be honest, most of us didn't until level 60 plus because they just shoehorn them in at that point. What advice do you have for me getting back? Practice. That's it. Practice and feel it around. It's not going to be immediate, but this is the same advice I would give to anyone. Practice. You're not going to be ever instantly good at anything. You might have an affinity for things. You're never going to be instantly good at anything. you got to practice. And right? it's a simple, simple way of living outside of just games. Practice. Got it. All right, and final question on the Forbes, it looks like. Hey, Haps, hope all is well. I got two quick questions for you this week. One, who's been your favorite character to play in Smash Ultimate? Dude, I've actually really liked a lot of the additions. Inkling is as fucking annoying as she is wonderful to play. Um, Simon and Richter, both the Belmonts, have been excellent. I really enjoyed all the returning Pokemon characters. Uh, I haven't gotten to play Mewtwo yet, but I've played against a few Mewtwo's, and uh, I'm enjoying some of the differences that I'm remembering from way back when with him. Uh, Lucario has always been a favorite. Pokemon Trainer has always been a favorite. The Puff has always been a favorite. Odd oddly, only Pikachu and Pichu are the only two I never really dive into. I still, still got to try Greninja and Incineroar, um, but all the Pokemon characters. And then even like as I was playing through World of Light, I had to play some like really oddball characters. Um, characters that maybe are from the older games that I never played much, like uh, Donkey Kong, for example. I don't know. I just feel like overall it's so smooth that I'm not really disliking any characters except for i don't know i'm sure i could probably think of a couple that i haven't liked i've never been a big mario fan 
Uh, even though I don't, I don't think he's bad. I just not a personal fan of him. So I'd say probably of the new characters, though Simon so far has been a pretty big favorite. I just got Richter, and they're pretty similar. They're Echo characters, so eh, we'll we'll see how I actually end up feeling about that. And uh, let's see. Finally, we have. Let's see. What were your thoughts on the last Remnant remaster? So I've only played through about an hour of it, barely even. Um, I saw you did the live stream, which I sadly missed. I was thinking of picking up because I enjoyed the combat system. My last memory of the game was being the final boss, waiting two hours for the final cutscene to load. You won't have to worry about that anymore. It's it's moved on since then. I think even the Steam version didn't have that issue. From what I understand, Last Remnant's biggest flaw when it came out was how buggy it was. And from even going back to the Steam release that's no longer available, um, I heard that fixed a lot of them, and now this is remastered, and it's just, you know, improved upon with the additional content and the additional things that were added to the Steam version. So, if the bugginess was the problem, that shouldn't be an issue anymore. If, uh, if the gameplay is what you liked, then buy it, because the gameplay is something that's... It requires a lot of information, and playing The Last Remnant blind is probably one of the more daunting RPGs that you could possibly approach. If you don't understand all the different terminologies, if you don't understand how to do uh, class advancement, like, you know, equipping the right types of weapons, and only using certain skills or even disabling certain other skills in order to make sure you learn the right thing. It's a very scary game to play blind, especially because I don't know if they ever explain about how the enemies get stronger the more you grind. So you generally don't want to grind too much, use the armor to offset the power of the enemies, and then grind for the super bosses endgame so you get better stats. It's, it's, it's intense. Last Remnant is a very, very intense game of, of RPG elements, so... If you enjoyed all that and you just want to play something that looks better and is less buggy, then The Last Remnant Remastered will definitely satiate your desire. And I am looking forward to moving back into it once my Smashness is done. But then Atlas comes out on, oh god, I'm going to be in New Jersey when Atlas comes out. Atlas comes out. Uh, the next update for Opera Omnia with the Alice A event. Fucking, uh, what's the other one? The Final Fantasy 15 half of the collaboration. The Garuda fight is going to be available on the 13th. And I'm going to be in New Jersey, so I got to do it all when I come back. And I don't even know if I'll be fucking done with Smash by then in terms of the world of light. It's going to... I'm fucking scared, all right? I got, I got a lot of stuff to do. So uh, now I'm thinking about that. Let me see if there's any decent questions from the Twitch chat before I wrap this video up. So Twitch chat, if you got something, I'll tell you if it's good or not. If not, then I'm hungry. I'm going to go eat after we're done with these questions. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and then Dauntless just updated, and I haven't even had time to get to that yet because of Smash. Ugh... Twitch said, ask me questions. All right, first question kind of just plays off of exactly what I was leaving off on before we moved into the Twitch questions. Haps, how do you feel about Dauntless currently? What do you think of the state of it now from when it first started? So Dauntless has vastly improved since it first started um, in terms of the number of weapons available, number of behemoths available, the actual structure of the game, the actual progression of the game, uh, the number of exotics that are available. And I feel like they're starting to really hit a stride. We've been seeing like a new behemoth every month for the past several months. We've seen Valamir most recently. Uh, there's Batcat, who was a fantastic addition. The dired version of Skarn, who very much deserved it. We still have more dire versions that need to be incorporated or brought back from like the earlier beta phases that we had. Um, something like Thunder Deep Drask, for example. And uh, they've really hit a kind of stride. And on top of that, the optimizations that have been taking place. Now, there's still plenty of work that can be done. I think that they need to start really finding more of a moder um, uh, monetization pattern. They have a hunt pass that's very akin to Fortnite season passes where you buy it and then you can earn stuff while playing it or you can do like a free version of it where you don't put any money into it and you can earn the paid currency doing that. So it's uh, they're, they're finding things. I think they still need to find more things, more things that they can monetize because one of my biggest concerns with Dauntless is I don't think they have enough of a monetization in place and that always is something that's scary for me because when i really enjoy something i want to see it make money um and it's just as long as it's within reason and it's not like going going too far into like a pay to win territory kind of thing and i hope dauntless can find that stride because if we can have a cross-platform free-to-play monster hunting game that's essentially what dauntless is on the cusp of becoming it just needs a little bit of a push the fact that it's going to be cross-platform when it hits consoles in april um, cause it's going to be hitting the Epic game store, PS4 and Xbox. It's going to, the fact that it's going to be cross-platform is huge because that's the one advantage it's going to really, really have. And eventually they'd like to hit switch 
as well as uh, potentially mobile, which I could see work. If it works for Fortnite, PUBG, I could see it very much working for Dauntless. It would be kind of strange, though, to, to play with someone on mobile, especially with the fear that they would disconnect in the middle of a cross-platform hunt. So, uh, yeah, there's there's so many there's so many things, and I hope they continue to do them, because if they can keep updating a new behemoth a month, fixing up new features, um, shoring up ways of progression, adding new exotics, if they can just get to that point where they can do massive content drops on top of minor content drops, then uh, that's going to be that's going to be dope. I'm really looking forward to that. All right. Oh, this one. Oh, my God. This question's definitely going in the video. Haps. I feel about the VGAs this year. You know what's funny? They're not the VGAs. They're actually TGAs, the Game Awards. I always call them the VGAs, but they are the Game Awards. Uh, were you surprised or disappointed with any of the winners? Do you think Red Dead Redemption deserved as many wins as it got? Let me be perfectly clear. Red Dead's a good game. It's a great game in a lot of regards. I don't think it deserved to win some categories. I don't believe Monster Hunter deserved to win Best RPG either, because it's got some pretty... Outside of the actual killing of the bosses of the of, of the enemies the game really doesn't have a whole lot and that's kind of that's it's something that's iconic of the monster hunter series and it's great that the gameplay matters most but an rpg is more than just one element and the story and the actual i guess user interface and the interactions and the the way the hub works and there's a lot of things that are not high quality in monster hunter other than the graphics and the gameplay. But those two things are fucking awesome. But I don't think they deserve to win Best RPG of the Year with just those two things. I feel like Octopath or Dragon Quest would have definitely deserved more. Dragon Quest, for me, probably would have been the most deserved winner on that. As long as you don't talk about the OST. Because that was a disaster for Dragon Quest. Um, God of War definitely deserved to win Game of the Year. But I thought there was actually a lot of good candidates. I just personally didn't want to see Red Dead win anything else. I was just... And... A lot of people also got pretty upset with Red Dead in terms of best score. I'd like to remind everyone a score isn't just the best sounding song. It literally is how does the soundtrack interact with the game and the gameplay itself. And Red Dead does a fantastic job at that. I saw people laugh at like, oh, what the fuck are these songs that they're performing on stage from Red Dead? This shit sucks. I'm like, that's because it's supposed to be like alongside a scene in the game the scene that it's from it's probably like gut-wrenching in terms of the emotion that's going through you and i feel like that's a big thing that's missed with uh best score category i'd also like to say that none of these fucking things matter no one gives a shit about the actual game awards so i i, I just feel like if there's one thing i wish octopath had one best score but i cannot actually take it away from red dead after thinking about it in hindsight only because of just how Good, how well it encapsulates what's happening in the game. If you had separated OST from score, I'd take a different title. But for score, that's it's it's something. It's definitely something coming out of Red Dead. But other than that, no. I mean, a lot of the categories don't give a shit. Like the esports categories are all fucking stupid. Who cares about ninety percent of that shit? Best player, best streamer. It literally best best content creator was. Who's the most popular Fortnite player? And of course, Ninja's gonna win that, which is fine. He totally deserves it out of the people who's there. He's done his legwork, but it's like, <laughs> why did you even do that category if you were only gonna include people who play the same one fucking game? So, there you go. Uh, but I was pretty happy with it overall. We got a lot of great announcements out of it. Uh, when I looked back, Atlas, I mentioned earlier, the Dauntless announcement for a console, which um, I had no idea about it. I was actually really shocked about that. Um, God, there's so many Crash Team Racing. There's actually a lot of really cool things that came out of that. So, uh, I... Overall, happy. But who gives a shit about the actual rewards? No point in complaining, really. Alright, so those are the only questions we're going to include from the Twitch chat for this week. But we did have a couple, at least. Uh, so, thanks. It's good to have questions from the Twitch chat. Some weeks I go without any of them because I don't think any of them are worth putting in the video. So anyway, uh, thank you again, and thank you again to our Patreon sponsors uh, who we named at the beginning of the video. Thank you for combating hashtag demonetize. If you have questions for Mondays with Mr. Happy, and you want to make sure I see them, go to the Dream Network forums on the description of the YouTube video, click that link, copy-paste it, whatever it is you got to do, and then ask your questions on the forum thread that's listed there. That way, I see it, I answer it, even if it's something super simple, I can, I'll at least visually get to 
decide whether or not it's worth my time. And then it, if it isn't, I'll just answer you real quick and then move on. Or if it's a really short question. But anyway, thank you again. I'm going to wrap up here on the YouTube side. Twitch, I'll still be hanging out for a few more minutes. But thank you for watching on YouTube. And I'll see you next time. Until then, take care.